Hello, and thank you for joining us for the latest QuantumScape educational discussion about the importance of energy density. I'm Asim Hussain, Chief Marketing Officer here at QuantumScape, and today I am joined by my colleague, Will Hudson, our VP of Product. We're also thrilled to have a very special guest, Peter Uris, High Voltage Systems Concept Lead at Audi. Peter has a PhD in electrical engineering and has been with Audi for nearly a decade. His expertise has been key in developing Audi's next generation battery systems that will help support them on their path toward electromobility. Welcome, Peter, and thank you both for joining us today from Bologna, Italy. It's a great opportunity for both of you to be there at the same time for us to do this discussion. So we're gonna get a crash course on energy density from Will on battery performance, and then Peter will put this into context for automotive applications and share how auto OEMs are addressing consumer demands with next generation batteries. Before we get started as a public company, I'm obliged to tell you that any type of forward-looking statements that we make, such as projections of our technology performance, are subject to risks described in our SEC filings. So with that, let's get started with Will. Okay, thanks, awesome. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure for both of us to, to be here today. I'm gonna start with a little bit of motivation. I think we're probably all aware that the automotive industry is undergoing a rapid transformation uh, to, to electric vehicles. Uh, it's obviously a very ex exciting development. I think the last few years in particular have been exciting with the introduction of quite a few new EVs from both the established players like our colleagues at Audi, as well as some startups. Uh, that being said, there's quite a long way to go. So what this slide shows is that as of last year, roughly 90% of the cars that were sold worldwide still had an internal combustion engine. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a long way to sort of um, come still to overcome this. It's our view at QuantumScape that the battery remains the main limitation uh, to, to further electrifying the, the vehicle fleet. Uh, and we feel that there are five key things that need to simultaneously be addressed in order for the battery and the electric vehicle to truly become mainstream. So you can see those things on the right. And today, what I wanna focus on is the first one. Um, so energy density, we'll talk a little bit about what that is as a concept, as it relates to batteries um, and how we can improve it. So a little bit of background on energy density. This is an interesting chart, I think, it shows kind of the whole history of progress in terms of uh, lithium ion cell energy density. So the, the curve that you see here represents kind of the state of the art. So the best available cells each year going all the way back to the founding or the, the first introduction of the lithium ion cell back in 1991 by Sony. And what you can see is a nice pace of steady progress that occurred for really the first two decades or more. Uh, maybe that's not surprising for a, for a new technology. There was lots of room for improvement. But if you look at the last 10 years, this pace has sort of slowed, right? So we've reached kind of a plateau period where uh, the technology is, is relatively mature and it's becoming harder and harder to find sort of room for further improvement. So next, let me take just a quick minute to explain the concept of, of energy density as it relates to batteries. I like to do this with an analogy. So I'm gonna use the analogy of storing energy in a reservoir above a hydroelectric dam. So I have that pictured here on the left. And the way to think about this is that there's really two things that affect the amount of energy that we can store in the system. So the first is the total amount of water. Right? We just have a collection of water droplets or water molecules. The more we have, the more energy we can store. And the second factor is the height. Right? So there's a, there's a distance between what, what we have at the top, the upper reservoir, and the lower reservoir at the bottom. And due to the force of gravity, we can use the stored energy of the water in the upper reservoir the whole way down as it cascades over the dam. So our battery, pictured on the right, is a lot like this except that instead of water, we use lithium ions to store the energy. And instead of height, we use voltage. So when we plug the battery in the first time, we would basically pull the lithium ions out from the cathode, which is like our lower reservoir in this case, 
and they would move upward to the anode or the upper reservoir, and they would be working against the voltage. And then when we want to use the battery to turn on a light bulb or power our car, we basically let those lithium ions fall back down. So that's kind of the basic concept of energy storage. Now, how about energy density? Well, there's two ways to think about this. The first is in terms of space. So if we have a certain amount of energy, how much room does that um, system take up? And this is what we call the volumetric energy density. We measure it in terms of watt hours per liter. So going back to that uh, earlier chart that we looked at. And this matters for vehicles, maybe in an obvious way. Uh, we need a certain amount of energy to drive a certain distance, but we only have so much room in the vehicle, right? So we can put those batteries maybe underneath the car, we can put them in the trunk, we can pick where to, where to put them, but we have a finite space. And the second uh, concept here is the gravimetric energy density. This is the amount of energy that we can store in a given weight. And it turns out this is also important for vehicles because the weight affects the driving behavior, it affects the dynamics, it also affects the efficiency, right? So there's sort of a virtuous cycle. If we can improve the energy density, we actually get more efficient and we can drive further, right? And we need less batteries to go the same distance. So these are kind of two uh, related concepts that both matter uh, for electric vehicles. So now to bring this back to the battery cell, Again, I have a schematic of a, what we call a unit cell, so kind of the core um, you know, internals of, of the battery system with a little bit more detail than last time. So here you can see a cathode on the bottom and an anode on top, but you can see that these two electrodes are composed of um, various materials, uh, what we call active material particles. And so even though the lithium ion is the thing that's sort of storing the, the energy and transporting the charge, it's typically, um, or needs to be um, stored within some other compound. And it turns out that one of the main limitations to improving energy density in today's lithium ion batteries relates to the anode. So this, this top electrode in the picture. It turns out that we today use typically carbon or graphite, sometimes some silicon, and we need more of those materials than the lithium ions that we're trying to store. So just to use kind of the most common example, a graphite anode requires six carbon atoms for every lithium molecule. And so that carbon brings extra mass and it takes up extra space. So if we could find a way to reduce or eliminate those components, that would help us improve our energy density. So if we just come back quickly to our uh, hydroelectric dam example, this would be as if our upper reservoir was filled with a bunch of islands. So that's what I've tried to depict here. We can still store just as much water, but if we have a bunch of islands throughout the, the, the system, the lake, then you can imagine that it takes much more area to store the same amount um, of water, which is again, storing our energy. So what are we gonna do about this? Well, this is kind of the, um, you know, quantum scapes approach. And if we look at the lithium ion cell on the left, you can see what we think is a better, uh, more efficient, more energy dense architecture now on the right. So we have a very similar cathode in this case, but instead of the graphite or carbon or silicon based anode, when we assemble our cell, we actually have no material at all. And that's why we call it the anode-free lithium metal architecture. So that's what's pictured in the middle. When we charge the cell up again the first time, we move those lithium ions from their ca the cathode, that lower reservoir, up to the anode. But in this case, we plate them out as fully dense lithium metal, where all of the lithium ions are sort of in contact with one another. And we have no islands. We have nothing kind of in the way. And what this allows us to do is store the same amount of energy in less space and also with less weight because we don't have the mass that would be occupied by the graphite or the silicon. So that's kind of the approach. And if we put some numbers to it, you can see on this chart sort of what that improvement, what that benefit can look like. So what I have on this slide is two important properties. We have the energy density, in this case, the volumetric energy density on the x-axis. 
And then I added one other important property, which is the charge time on the y-axis. And if you focus first kind of in the left, the bottom left corner, you can see some real world data points for recent state-of-the-art uh, vehicles and the cells that they're using. And I think the takeaway here is that in conventional lithium ion cells, you can push the energy density sort of to the extreme. In that case, you may reach around 700, maybe 750 watt hours per liter, but you'll tend to have slow charge times, right? Maybe a little, you'll give up a little bit of power. On the other hand, you can take a different approach. You can relax the energy density a little bit, move towards the left, and you can have somewhat faster charge times. But at the end of the day, there's sort of a frontier is the term that we use for it that you can't get beyond. And the only way to get beyond this frontier is to use new materials or new architectures. So something like this anode-free lithium metal solid state approach that, that QuantumScape is using. So then if you look up to the, the, the top right of the chart, you can see two new frontier curves. And what we have in the dark green is a curve that represents QuantumScape's initial five amp hour, what we call our slim format cell. And the idea behind this cell is that it, it can simultaneously have both more energy density and faster charge time than the best available cells on the market today. In the light green, we have another frontier curve, which is even further out. And this is what we might expect from a slightly larger format cell that QuantumScape is going to work on uh, in the future. And so I want to end here and hand it over to uh, Peter. I think he's also going to present the slide and then you know we'll go from there. Thanks, Will. So um, I think you summarized it quite well. What, what are the demands from uh, uh, the OEM point of view? Yeah. What what uh, are we? What are our uh, uh, what uh, are our biggest uh, challenges? Yeah. And it's uh, gravimetric energy density. It's volumetric energy density. It's charging time, and of course uh, the cost issue. And here on this slide, you see coming from the uh, Audi Atron towards the PPE platform, uh, what has been the um, results of, of our development. And you see it always comes from, from the cell. I don't want to go too much into these numbers, but you see the um, increase in energy density, 15% on cell level, 20% on module level, and 30% on pack level. Uh, you see the plus in charging time, so we get faster uh, uh, for uh, in, in charging, and also the battery costs decreases up to 15%. But, but um, as you said, yeah, we, we are uh, heading towards a plateau. Um, when you when you look at uh, conventional cells, uh, we we are um, <clears throat> the the benefits or, or the, the increases in energy uh, density um, gets lower and lower, and so. The, the quantum scape uh, technology is really a step function towards uh, the uh, higher energy density. Um, yeah, other possibilities, of course, are to increase the amount of silicon, for example, and so on. But uh, the, the values you, you named are quite uh, um, in the right range. Yeah, 800, 700 watt hours per liter, um, 15 minutes up to 25 minutes. It's always this triangle of um, energy uh, density, uh, fast charging, and um, lifetime of the cell, which you can shift, but you can have everything. So, um, yeah, quite, quite good. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So, um, Will and Peter, you know, I think maybe where we could start is, could we talk about, um, you know, why the lithium ion has sort of advanced the way it has with the conventional cells? And what what's the point at which, you know, there's a reason for the plateau, but there's been significant advancements. So maybe we could start by talking about what those advancements have been a little bit in terms yeah. of what, what they've been able to do. Yeah, no, I think that that's a great question. And maybe I'll start on this slide. Uh, so there's a number of factors that, that we talked about a few of the things that can, um, you know, that affect the energy density, but we didn't talk about all of them. So if we refer to this, the schematic on the left, right, for the conventional case here, basically everything that's pictured will contribute, right, to the final volume and the final weight of the system. So 30 years ago, when lithium ion cells were introduced, the current collectors were thicker for example. 
the separator that's in the middle, which we haven't talked a lot about, was thicker. Um, some of the things that aren't pictured here would be, uh, you know, the space that kind of goes around the stack before it's put into the cell package, the size of the terminals, the headspace for the terminal connections to be made. And in those early days, those things weren't optimized. So some of these kind of, you know, design parameters, the peripherals, if you will, um, affect the end, you know, figure, and, and those can all be adjusted. That's one factor. I think another factor relates to the, the active materials themselves. Yeah. There's, we've gone through generations, and I think, you know, Peter, in the, in, in the automotive world, you've probably seen uh, from, for example, if we take the cathode, initially lower nickel content, maybe it was one third, one third, one third, or something in the early days, and now you're seeing it move upward to yeah. 60 or 80%. So there's some things on that side that, that, that also affect the, the end numbers, but you can't go infinitely far eventually. And, and also on system level, it always has advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, going higher with the uh, uh, amount of, of nickel uh, makes it harder to, to control the system in terms of thermal propagation, for example. Uh, getting the cells bigger, getting the modules uh, uh, bigger, uh, it's always, uh, you have always to, to look at it on the system level. Yeah? So the advantage, advantage, uh, advancement in, uh, on, on cell level does not always uh, pay out for the system. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, batteries are all about trade-offs and we found some ways to like reduce the trade-offs, but maybe not eliminate them entirely. Yeah. yeah. So then if conventional, you know, what, as, as we're reaching that limitation, what are the lithium ion batteries missing, so to speak? And, you know, in terms of what kind of energy density you need for the next level, right? Um, I think we have a number of long range vehicles out there. We also have vehicles that can fast charge. Maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the data points on that performance frontier. Um, Will around, you know, as we look at some of the examples here, um, what are some of the trade-offs that you know we're considering as as a as a battery maker, you know, from a quantum scape perspective, but also from Peter from an Audi perspective, as you guys look at these things and look at the models that et cetera that you have, how do you begin to consider those trade-offs? So I think uh, from an OEM point of view, uh, there will be always the need to to make the system smaller and to make it uh, lighter. Yeah, in terms of the CO2 footprint from cradle to grave. It's super important to have a very, very light vehicle. And now we look at vehicles where one third uh, of the weight, at least uh, for, for, from the vehicle is just a battery system. So uh, this work will never stop to, to get more into gravimetric and volumetric energy density. And then of course, as I, as I explained, there's always this trade-off between energy density charging time or in a resistance and uh, a lifetime of the cell. So uh, this, you, you can adjust it towards maybe um, batteries which have a, a little bit less energy content, but you can super fast charge them. And I think in the future, when the infrastructure uh, is established, yeah, maybe this will be a way also to reduce the CO2 footprint in total, but there will be always cars uh, uh, which which have the demand for for uh, long range uh, um, uh, capability without without charging. So um, it really depends. Yeah, maybe high performance cars uh, have uh, will will go for for um, yeah more for fast charging because then you have also the opportunity to um, decharge quite fast. Uh, so, so that's, uh, that's quite, uh, quite a good fit. And um, the other cars, there will be always uh, the, the need really for, for uh, cars with very, very long range. So this will, this will never stop. And there is not a number I can say today, like, yeah, 750 watt hours per liter is enough for a customer. It will be right. never enough. And not just for the vehicle uh, uh, developing companies. Uh, I mean, this is a, uh, to store energy in a small space with at, uh, with with really uh, a small amount of material with a good CO two footprint for the product will always be a big challenge. Right. So Peter just I mean, just wanted one... to follow up on that. So 
Um, you're you're talking always about these these trade offs. Maybe you know you could talk a little bit about how do you assess what may work for different models. You know, because for example, people think you know this is solving one equation, but the reality is that you have different needs based on different profiles of the type of vehicle it is, right? So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you guys think about that at Audi as you think about the different um, model lineup that you have? So there will be, of course, uh, within, in a big company like the VW Group, there will be different uh, uh, different um, chemistries for different cars. Yeah, you will have a cost optimized chemistry. You will have a, a best in class chemistry. And then, as I told, uh, as I explained, uh, maybe for for high performance cars, uh, you will go more into the the power region, and uh, for for long range cars, more into the um, in, into the long distance or energy density re region. Um, but also uh, this, uh, I told like the, the battery system has like one third of the whole vehicle weight, but it has at least one third of the whole vehicle cost. So this cost optimization uh, is maybe the third dimension in this in this equation. Great. And then, you know, I think um, one of the things, Will, that we hear a lot, you know, of course, energy density is important, but just, you know, for example, you guys are contrasting, there's sort of the trade-off between charge time and energy density. But I do want to bring it back because you hear a lot of different, um, you know, numbers thrown out there in isolation, but there is an and aspect to it, whether it's charge time or other variables. So well, could you just touch a little bit on how you have to bring this all together versus it being just a single data point? Yeah, sure. You know, and we didn't really talk about where this trade-off comes from. I, I don't want to go into a ton of detail, but I can maybe quickly explain that. Um, you know, the way to maximize energy density in the cell, any cell, whether it's a lithium ion cell or a quantum scape cell, is to have um, as much active material as possible and as little of everything else. And so if you took it, take a look at either one of these stacks and just imagine that we were to expand the thickness of the electrodes, they would be relatively uh, thicker, take up you know, more of the, the, the space and the weight compared to the current collectors and the separator, the non-active components. So that helps for all systems. The problem with that is that when you make things thicker, it uh, slows the system down. Right? We have to move the lithium ions further and we get less power. So we, that's why we always have this trade-off and we have these different frontier curves that you see now on this chart here. But I think to try to answer your question, what QuantumScape is trying to do is develop a product that reduces the compromise. I don't think it's appropriate to say that we can eliminate the compromise because that's not, that's not possible, I don't think. But if we can... Uh, produce and, and deliver a cell that is both faster charging and higher energy density than what's available today, obviously that helps. For sure. yeah. And then as Peter also mentioned, that's going to be just the beginning. They're going to keep asking us for something that's better. Oh, and for certain vehicles, they'll say, guys, in this case, our customers want it to charge really, really, really fast. Please prioritize that. And in other cases, they're going to say, guys, we need 600 mile range or, or whatever, right? A thousand kilometer range please prioritize that. And that's where we can start to make a choice, right? Do we right. go towards one side of the spectrum or the other side? So we'll just, you know, to, to build on that, what, you know, it's a very exciting time at QuantumScape where we now have, you know, a projection of our first product in terms of uh, the five amp hour cell that's on this slide. Uh, maybe you could compare and contrast a couple of data points there just to, as examples. Um, as we're looking to, you know, uh, further take these to market in terms of what might be the end result, depending on that trade-off between energy density and charge time. Yeah, I'm happy to. And I think it's probably worth caveating that lots of factors, not just the two on this chart, would go into a decision, right, mm -hmm. when you're making a cell. So here we show the charge time and the energy density, but we talked about cost. We, there's lifetime, lifetime, there's safety, there's many, many things. So I just, I'll put that out there first. But in terms of the, 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 the numbers that you can see on the slide, um, we've got a handful of kind of 
you know, state-of-the-art leading vehicles here. Uh, down in the bottom right is the, the pickup truck from Rivian, um, and they're using a 2170 cylindrical cell. And because it's a big, heavy car, they really had to prioritize energy density. So this is the one that's the furthest to the right on the chart, on, on, on the, the whole graph, right? Uh, but it also is the slowest charging. You go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and you, you see a different approach, right? This is the Porsche Taycan cell. And you know we know from their public statements and, and, and from speaking with, with this team that they prioritize performance and charge time. And so I think they're still leading in the marketplace in terms of those two things, at least near the top but they had to give up a little bit of energy density in order to get there. And so you can see the numbers right there, I think charging in about 17 minutes today uh, from 10 to 80%, which is quite fast, but it's a you know low to mid 600 watt hour per, per liter cell. So again, uh, what QuantumScape will try to do is beat that charge time and deliver more energy than this, this Rivian uh, 2170 cell. Right, so, so on that, you know, the, if you look at the curve for the five amp hour cell, what would be the contrast for optimizing for range versus the optimizing for um, charge time? Yeah, so you know, I think with that format, we have choices to make still, right? About um, which which side of the spectrum do we want to be on? And I, you know, I think you can sort of read it all off the graph, but you get into the mid eight hundred watt hour per liter uh, range if we're willing to accept you know, something like 15 to 20 minute charge times. If you want to push towards 10 minute charge times, that's something that the system is capable of doing, but you'll have to give up a little bit of energy density and you come back into the 700s. I think that's probably, you know, the way to look at it. Great. So, um, Peter, um, as you guys think about the future and what is important, um, you know, as, as you guys are building your electrification you know, electrified fleet and what performance you expect. Um, how do you guys begin to think about these next generation batteries coming to market, whether it's QuantumScape or others, you know, in terms of what that allows you to do um, as you look to the future for your systems? So, so of course, we are also looking to convey Single cells so far, yeah. Uh, we we um, as everybody, uh, there's the opportunity to to uh, increase the amount of silicon uh, to go uh, <clears throat> further with the energy density and also uh, uh, to to lower the the charging time uh, with with silicon. But you have you will get this swelling problem. You will get uh, you will get trouble with the third dimension uh, lifetime. Yeah. So you have to handle the swelling problem in the system. We have a lot of uh, uh, good ideas also to optimize. Uh, all of this uh, um, on system level, yeah. The the system is also it's quite a very very exciting time, yeah, because nobody knows what's the final battery system uh, of the future. So there are a lot of optimization on cell level, system level, and also on battery or uh, cell level module level, and also on battery system level. And um, but of course we are we are uh, looking forward to to this next step, yeah, coming out from the conventional. Uh, uh, lithium ion technology uh, to solid state batteries. I mean, every OEM is, is looking at, at solid state batteries and uh, QuantumScape's approach is, is very straightforward. Yeah, it's, it's an all-in approach, uh, which really uh, shows this nice numbers. Uh, everybody will love it if I could have this down now and put it into the car so far. So uh, of course we, we are looking at this, yeah. And uh, it would give a big, 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 big benefit to our customer uh, in terms of uh, range, in terms of also design, yeah, the volumetric den energy density also makes something possible like maybe cells which are less higher and our design will love it to have 10 millimeters uh, less higher car yeah, because it completely looks different. So we are we are really uh, excited uh, uh, to, to work uh, with, with uh, such cells in the future, yeah. Great, well, um... Will and Peter, thank you so much uh, for joining us from Italy to make this work. Um, and, you know, I, I want to thank you guys uh, for working through the discussion and, and all of my questions. Um, you know, as a component of the educational discussion 
you know, that QuantumScape has, we're going to be doing a series of blogs on energy density, as well as trying to broaden this conversation about what that energy density means in, in different types of applications. Um, and those blogs uh, for all of the folks who are watching this can be found on our website, as well as they will be linked through the YouTube uh, description uh, below this video. So um, this was a great conversation. Uh, we hope you all had some learned something new and hope you'll join us again soon uh, for the next set of talks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lizzie. Thank you.